Mark is the principal researcher at the Built en uh, Environment at the Built Environment Unit of the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. As part of his 20 years policy research experience, Mark spent two years in national government setting up a research unit in the Department of Human Settlements and seven years managing the Urban Land Markets Program in Southern Africa called Urban Landmark. So Mark, please. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for the invitation. Um, in, in 1993, I was doing my master's and I wrote my dissertation, which was titled The Place of the Poor in the Post-Apartheid City. And I think at the age of 30, I knew the answer better than I know it now after 20 years of thinking about trying to transform the apartheid landscape. It's a really difficult one. But I just want to raise four issues sort of in opening. Um, the first, I mean, the, the, the sketching of the context and of the injustice of the non-transformation of space has been written recently very well by Richard Pithouse in his article on the urban land question, which I'd certainly refer you to. And he talks about the fractures. On it's on your site, yes. <laughs> um, he talks about the fractures that run through society and how those are expressed in space. Um, but as my first point, I think we just need to remind ourselves without a long history lesson where it came from and remember that segregation goes way back um, into the last three, four centuries and that urban planning has been segregated for, uh, since 1650s um, and the emergence of colonial cities and it's, it's well documented and in fact South African cities are fairly typical of colonial cities up until the 1950s, the South African cities were typical, similar to Nairobi, similar to Chinese port towns, um, similar to quite a few other places, even in, in French and Belgian Africa, where planning laid out zoned areas and class areas. And what obviously then characterizes the South African city is from the 1950s onwards, uh, the rigorous and evil separation of races and further building of the city in that segregated form. And so what we have to remember is that planning is not separate from power. Power is expressed in planning. Um, as the famous academic Eddie Izzard said, um, talking about British colonialism, he said, we stole countries, that's how you build an empire. I'm quoting. Um, we stole empires by using flags. He said, what you do is you arrive at a new country and you stick in a flag. And what he said is, we would, the British would stick in a flag and say, I claim India for Britain. And people that were already there would say, you can't claim our land. And the colonialists colonialist would say, but we have a flag. Um, and so what that illustrates is the use of law and legal systems to ex as well as military power to exert rights over space. And, and if you talk about the apartheid landscape now and the existing land ownership that exists in the cities, it's not flags necessarily, it's boundaries and it's, it's title deeds and that exerts space and that keeps the apartheid city very much as it is. There was even a serious discussion in, 19, in the 1960s when the US realized they would make it to the moon, if you, believe, if you don't believe the conspiracy theory, um, they talked about annexing the moon as property for the US. And they're even talking now about selling off plots on the moon in order to fund space travel. Now, what I'm trying to just say is that this issue of property is very much at the base of what we're talking about. And our exertion of rights over property is, is quite typical of placemaking and that humans tend to make places and to exert rights over property and the rich have a lot more power and a lot more backing them up in terms of the legal system and money to afford that legal system. And even in the way that informal settlements are formed, people who start off in land, uh, on occupying land, it starts off as a fairly informal system. And with urban landmarks work, we, we tracked quite a few um, cities and settlements where as the land formation and placemaking process takes place, 
how people move onto the land. There's a fairly loose set of rules, how you should come into the land, how you should hang on to that land, how you can buy and sell that land. And then it becomes more structured, the authority systems emerge, boundaries emerge, and then it gets codified. And then the people that are in a neighborhood tend to shut out the people still coming in. So there's a typical human process of, of land occupation, but it's not disconnected from power and the exertion of power and the use of instruments to do that. And really then what that takes us to is a point that you, that you need to really remake the rules of how places are made and how we see property. Um, but what's quite interesting also from some of the urban land markets work is that even in places like Luanda and Maputo and Huambo, the, even if the state owns the land and there's not meant to be a market in land, there is. And we've tracked those markets very carefully. So then the second point I'd like to make is what does it look like? We talk about the apartheid city. Um, there's been some very good work done by Catherine Cross quite recently where what she did was they took data of where shack settlements are in South African cities and they took migration into cities over the last 10 years. Migration into cities is about 1.2% per annum, which is, which is not a huge... Um, it's, it's similar to Spain or uh, other countries. And so it's not a huge in-migration. It's, it's fairly big in, in number terms. But the cities in South Africa, when you track in-migration, um, unemployment, the per capita income, and then where you live in that city, it reveals a picture uh, which, is, which, means, which shows that it's very different in the different South African cities. When people move into cities, they definitely position close to work and, and job opportunities where they can find land. But where jobs are is very different. Um, for instance, in Johannesburg, there's obviously a very intense core with, a, with high incomes, and with a lot of job opportunities and other opportunities. And then as you go out of that core, then the rich, well, until you get to the periphery and then the, the poor are on the periphery again. In Cape Town, the middle of town has no poor people. I actually heard Helen Ziller in a UN event in Cape Town saying that in Cape Town, the poor don't belong in the center of Cape Town. They can't afford it, they shouldn't be there. And if you look at the structure of Cape Town, that's dead right. Uh, it's not morally right. It's factually correct that there's not a place for the poor in the middle of Cape Town. And that the t type of skills and land availability, land availability there is almost impossible. And so what, what do we do about that? So what I'm trying to say in that second point is that not all apartheid cities are the same. So putting people or, or setting up opportunities close to the center doesn't automatically work. You've got to, you've got to understand the structure of each city. The third point, I think, is what perpetuates this, and we've talked about property, I think. And you don't just overturn property systems. Um, you can work with those property systems to open up more land. Certainly the historical dispossession was the, was the grounding of it, and cities don't change very quickly. As we've seen, cities are made over time by many actors, but they, they put themselves down in buildings and boundaries and pipes and roads and they don't change overnight. What does change is how people can filter through cities, filter through housing stock, filter through buildings, filter through business opportunities. So people move through cities, but cities are pretty much there. And how cities are owned is therefore very important. Um, and so an equal city is not like an equilibrium where if things come right, the South African city will become equal just because the pendulum will swing back to some kind of equality. Because cities are built and are over centuries, they're quite difficult to change, incredibly difficult to change. And so that swing of the pendulum back to some form of equality and equal access for the poor needs direct intervention. Um, so I think the fourth point is what can we do? And <coughs> look, I'm, quite, I'm actually quite optimistic. Um, the first point to make, and I did try to get some more accurate figures, is that state land is, in the country is about 22%. 78% is, is privately owned. 
Now that's fine, if, and that's the 122 million hectares in the country, but only you know, 1.5% of that is built upon. So to have a, to have a percentage of 22%, 78% is not much use if we're only talking about the 1.5% that is built up, which is the city. So we need more accurate information about cities and who owns what. I did ask the Housing Development Agency for some figures yesterday. They were emailing me now as we were sitting here. And they say, for instance, in Johannesburg, if 25% of the land is owned by the state, 75% of that land is municipal land, 25% is other government departments. That would be different in Pretoria. But the problem is, okay, we need to break that down because state land includes reserves and mountains and rivers and parks and those kinds of things. So we need to be able to break that down. We need better information. The thing about what kind of interventions there are is that in terms of sort of land claims, a lot of the urban land claims were settled um, in the first 10 years of democracy through financial settlement, and that was certainly the case in Cato Manor in Durban, which was a very large swathe of land which was very well located and now has a lot of housing on it. Places like Cape Town where you have District 6 where there are land claimants, and I'm not an expert on this, but the use of very valuable land by land claimants is highly contested, as we've seen in District 6. And so land claims as a solution is, is difficult in that it's hard to, to, to turn it back that far. And I'm not against it. I'm just saying that the underlying patterns are not there. You could put a claim over a whole section of the city, which might be historical, which applies in Nairobi. So in times of drought in Nairobi, the Maasai can graze their cattle in certain parts of Nairobi because they have historical claim over parts of Nairobi, which obviously freaks out the parks department because a lot of the foliage gets eaten. Um, but it doesn't happen very often. So what I'm just saying is that you can't turn it back too far in terms of land claims. But there's a lot of other interventions which we have looked at. Um, there's incentives and there's regulations, and maybe I can come back to some of them in, in the discussion. But using property taxes to reinvest in the city um, is a kind of redistribution, and that's already happening. There's value capture where you use public investment to claw back the profits that the private sector makes once the investment is made, clawing that back into some kind of redistributionary fund, which allows you to fund housing in better locations. The Housing Development Agency was set up specifically uh, nationally to facilitate identification and release of land for low-income housing in better locations. So some of the institutional parts are in place. The big thing is what do we do about the private sector? But as I've said, the state land is there. At least 25% of municipal land is state land. And so there's a, lot, there's a lot that can be used. Expropriation can be used. It's an expensive process. Um, it's typically used for other types of infrastructure, but it's there, it's totally legal, and it's used all over the world. It's just how do you use it wisely. So I think a balance of regulatory and incentive-based interventions like urban development zones that allow you to engage the private sector with the public sector, with communities, in finding better located land. Last point, mm -hmm. our housing program in the first 20 years has exacerbated the inequality has only been driven on finding cheap land in order to deliver a better house, but cheap land equals bad location. So we really need to turn around our housing program. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark.